There is only one pioneer one. in the use of technology in the She shocked the, the patriarchy. So April, April 29th, I'm in. I'm kind of an oddity. In the early 80s, I was already being slammed pretty hard for not being a graphic designer, that I was an artist kind of mucking around in the design field. And some encouraged me to leave, predominantly men, who told me to get the hell out of the industry. My response was not only saying, if you're sick of me already, then here's another version of me. Graphic design uh, has always equal technology. These tools really freed me up to think about uh, how if you have a good idea, there aren't any boundaries. Anybody who's truly creative is, is driven. It's not what you do, it's who you are. I'm a graphic designer and an icon designer. I've done thousands of icons for hundreds of companies. When I first got to Apple, there weren't any tools to make icons. Andy Hertzfeld wrote this icon editor. You could turn one pixel off or on and it generated the code you needed. This control panel was done trying to avoid using words so it would be international. I got to do the tools in Mac Paint, and I'm kind of happy that 30 years later, they're still kind of kicking around. Before there was a command key, we were using the Apple, and Steve Jobs said, you guys are taking the logo in vain. There's too many apples on the screen. So I was kind of leafing through a simple dictionary. This was labeled feature, and that it was used to show places of interest. And that seemed okay, it's abstract, but a few years ago, someone emailed me. This guy said, no, it's actually a castle seen from above. And those are the four turrets. And I thought, wow, I had never thought about that. It did have meaning after all. I think we are a country of old people, of old spirit. We lack enthusiasm, the desire to move forward and work on our style. Being a girl, you always had to wear a skirt. It was impossible to move and dance in straight skirts. Women needed to be able to walk and run again. And I was a dancer myself. We introduced the mini skirt because although it was shorter, it still had the femininity and the, and the convention that the pants did not. <laughs> We were inspired by the generation of the year 2000. The first confirmation of our vision was when man walked on the moon in 1969. When you revolt against things that are outdated, you are taking the first giant step. We live in the most exciting time, but also the scariest time for designers where everything material, everything artificial, can be designed at the scale and sophistication that we sell. My focus is designing new materials for, with, and by nature. Today, we can look at the world in the resolution almost of human consciousness from the very, very small scale, the scale of particles and subatomic particles to atoms, nucleotides in the genome, to cells, to the human mind, to the Earth, to the solar system, to the Milky Way, to the visible universe, to maybe parallel universes. The famous Einstein saying, which I love, there are two ways to live your life. One is if nothing is a miracle. And the other is as if everything is a miracle. And that's who I am. Well, so I like the Beatles. And when I listen to that music, it, it brings back memories from those times. I hope I can achieve that somehow. 
that people will recall memories of that era in their lives when they see a video game they used to play. See, movies make you cry with the story you watch, but games make you cry because of your hardships in playing. So my job is to create a place for people to immerse themselves and get that experience. I'd, I'd like it to be something that leaves an impression. Like, I remember playing that with someone, or I played that with such and such, or even I remember playing that with dad. Those are the really important possibilities that video games hold. Type design is political and intimately entangled with capital. When we teach typography, the focus is on control, but we learn to master these rules as though they're universal, as though there exists an optimized way to read. Perfect typography means predicting an idealized reading experience and a very particular power dynamic involving knowledge, manipulation, and control. So um, I have been looking for queer typography. When I asked the question on Twitter, several folks replied with stylistic ideas, type that's been dressed up to carry a rainbow or adorned in a particular way. Can something that reads as, quote, corporate pride ever be considered queer? I don't think so. Queerness may be expansive, but one thing it's not is conformity within a corrupt system. I propose that we turn away from rainbow style and gender metaphors towards queer acts of doing focusing on the people and communities where good trouble emerges, those who perform deviant acts of design in the face of conformity. There is no queer typography, only queer acts of reading and writing. The heart of most creative work is purposeful play. The best definition that I've heard so far about play is from a psychology book which says that Play is really a flow state where we're reaching this optimal balance of opportunity and challenge given our skill sets. And it's really the ideal human state because we're completely absorbed in activity at hand. Using photography in my work, I can create objects or design sets and create the, the final result, whether it be an illustration, an ad campaign, or a video piece. The computer is an amazing tool in, a, in the creative industry, but it's not always the right one for every single project. Sometimes you can get even more interesting results getting off the computer and working with your hands. Well, I strive to create work that's emotional, that connects with people, and is also playful and has a sense of humor, um, because life's too short.
I think that uh, visions of the future serve many different purposes. You know, often they're used, say, within industry to try and set a direction or as a form of propaganda. And with speculative design, it was always trying to decouple it from that sort of agenda and not to say, here's a vision we should try and pursue and implement, but rather, here's just a very different way of thinking about reality or the world or social relations. Let's use that as a catalyst to spark further thinking and imagining. One of the questions we were asking ourselves was, you know, is the collective imagination of the future, are we holding it back through seeing so many images of the past about the future? You know, how do we actually start to show the future and what other ways aesthetically could we look at those? The crucial part of our work is, is saying we're all exposed to almost like a monolithic um, version of the future, but really we'd love to see just multiple versions and many, many different uh, futures for um, the stories that are framing technology and so on. So it's not an end point, but a counterpoint. That's the kind of space we want to be in. Koichi Sato grew up surrounded by mountains. His work has familiar motifs imbued with their sacred ether. They have the power to transport you to the realm of the gods. Besides their psychedelic nature, his gradients and luminous colors convey an optimism about the value of things. It's simple to find some form of relatability in his work and with the subjects that are captured. So much of his career was a reflection of his love of interacting with the world around him. Sato said quite early on that he lost interest in man-made things. He believed that it is a designer's job to create an era in which people can find their own expression, stimulate each other, and enjoy life without shrinking. I think if you look at Rochenko's work, you can find the roots to almost all the new developments, I think, in the 20th century, from abstract painting through Pollock and Rothko, the filmmaking through Hitchcock and uh, Orson Welles, architecture. I mean, the Bauhaus, I think, couldn't have existed without people like Rochenko. And now, a hundred years later, which we're virtually at, I think there's a new kind of underground feeling happening. And I think there's the possibility for new radical art. Rochenko and his fellow workers were driving for a new language for the proletariat. It was a popular language. They were finding something which was no longer elite, very simplified, and looking for absolutely new solutions that were not part of the bourgeois art world of the time. ばさを震わせてあなたの元へ届きませ。その右の屋根から隣の屋根に飛び移ってはけ抜けてその右の扉の壁があるんですよ。緑青っぽいその扉に飛び付いてあの配管を余地に登ってですね。あの屋根の上
Armin Hoffman brought Weingarten in, and Armin Hoffman represented the classic lineage from the Bauhaus, the grid, very simple, universal design. And Hoffman had the foresight to see that they needed that counterpoint to all that Swiss rigidity. But he also, I think, saw that Weingart was a consummate craftsman. If you ever saw him making one of those seemingly crazy posters with all the dot patterns, he was meticulous in his craft. For six months, you just kept letter spacing out the word Kunstgewerbeschule. And about halfway through, you'd be working on the sans serif and he'd go, okay, that comes good, it's okay. Go on to the serif. And then you do all it all over again with a serif twice a week. Hours, hours, days, days, days. So all you did was learn to letter space type. But guess what? I know how to letter space type now. There are so many colors we see. By moving, we can see things in detail, or as an overview. Katsui had a systematic and algorithmic method of design. He took photos and divided them into three channels, red, green, and blue. Then merged it to create something brand new. To him, this was the only way he could portray the true feeling of seeing light. To us, this is a normal process of design, but Katsui was exploring RGB layering before the Macintosh. He had a creative ability that was really beyond this world. Many designers design for themselves, but Katsui was always a designer for the people. It was never about him, but about sharing his discoveries with the world. And that is what I love about Katsui. Mr. Beaton, you've been described at various times, and in fact, you've described yourself, I think, at various times as an author, a designer, uh, a dandy, a painter, a photographer. Now, which of these is your main profession? I wish I knew. I'm afraid that's been my trouble for a very long time. What are you trying to do? I mean, have you ever formulated your purpose? Is it to make pretty things? Is it to, to reflect the age you live in? Is it just to entertain people? What are you after? I think I'm after expressing my instinct. Am I vain? What were your ambitions at that time? To be able to demonstrate that I was not just an ordinary anonymous person. It was up to me to find the sort of world that I wanted. You know, I created a fantasy. I really wanted to please myself. I need to please yourself, yes. Yeah. When we think of minimalism, we usually think of a very stare, hard-edged form. But the, these objects are more what I would call sensual minimalism, which is really about the human body. So they're amorphous and soft. And this is how we're born in a way. We're born in a womb. So I've always had this belief that our physical environment should be very non-obtrusive because they're an extension of us and, it's, and we are nature. We as human beings, 
had made a kind of Cartesian world, you know, where most of us live in a grid, like this room is a box, right? In a 2D kind of world that's opposing nature. And we're doing everything in our power, I think, human beings, to oppose nature because we don't want to believe that we are nature. We're soft, we're organic, we're volatile, and nature is a very organic, fluid, and endostopic uh, reality.